Good evening, I'm Jim Zirin. You're watching The Digital Age. With us tonight is a foreign policy expert, Jim Hogue. Jim Hogue is a distinguished journalist. He was the editor and publisher of the Chicago Sun-Times. He was the publisher of the New York Daily News. For eight years, he was the editor of the iconic foreign affairs magazine, certainly the gold standard in the field of foreign policy periodicals. Tonight, he will cover with us the hot spots of the world and tell us how the digital age may be affecting the fault lines in a dangerous global environment. Jim, we're delighted to have you with nice us. Nice to be here. Now, why don't we start with China, which seems to be on everybody's mind. Okay. Uh, what's going on there? Obama says he wants to pivot our foreign policy toward the Pacific. Uh, is he giving up one interest for another? N not really. I, I do think he has downgraded the importance of Europe to the United States in terms of uh, global security. <laughs> And frankly, with some good reasons. European nations continue to cut their defense budgets. And when you cut the defense budgets, you cut your resources. They have very little capability to project themselves around the world. The uh, recent NATO operation in Libya showed all sorts of shortfalls in the contributions made by European countries. But that's the downside. The upside is that there is just no question now that the focus in the world, not just for Asia, but in the world as a whole, in economics, in security, even in cultural matters, uh, is, is Asia. And at the heart of Asia is China. And China's historical experience is so profoundly different in terms of how it relates to its region than the European tradition. The European tradition was everybody was an expansionist at some point, and they had some nice big wars to see who was going to be more successful than the others. China's 5,000-year history is that they were the middle kingdom in all of Asia, and around them was a series of smaller, weaker states that were in a vassal role. And China, over many, many decades, developed a very sophisticated way of handling that, which was we will make sure that all our vassals tie to us, but that we also give them a good deal so that at the end of the year, so to speak, when you're adding things up, being a, a vassal to the Middle Kingdom made sense for most people. So we have to understand that looking at Asia today, we're not looking at an Asian version of the European 18th and 19th century with expansionist powers all trying to claim each other's lands and resources and so on. China is a much more what you would call a sovereignty um, um, a, so a sovereignty-focused country. Now, it's going after other people's resources, but primarily uh, in a more modern fashion, which is they're paying lots of prices for it. And the reason that they're doing that is that they need the resources at home for a vastly expanding economy and an expanding population. Now, we've always been paranoid about China in that we're worried that they are building up a hegemony in uh, in the Pacific, and uh, they're kind of paranoid about us because they're afraid of encirclement, which has exactly. always been their Achilles heel. And uh, now with this new pivot, uh, they see themselves, they've lost Vietnam, they've lost Burma, uh, they've lost the ASEAN countries, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, all they have left is North Korea, and that's not much of a vassal. Uh, so no, what that's you, very what's true. your take on all this? Um, first of all, I put, let me put it in historical uh, terms because they, history turns out to be much more important than we think when things get tense. The U.S.-China relationship in the 18th and 19th century was essentially a pretty good one. Two big continental societies um, that saw more in getting along together than not. Then along comes uh, the Chinese Revolution, and we decide that they are second only to the Soviet Union as a potential menace to the United States. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the amazing breakthrough uh, in the Nixon era of establishing relationships that we got back to a more even keel. And frankly, I think we've done, and the Chinese as well, have done a pretty good job of creating uh, a network of, of interaction, economic and otherwise, at the same time that basically we distrust each other. Now, what's happened recently, you mentioned, uh, we have made much more clear 
that we're establishing tighter relationships with all the countries around China, starting with Korea, South Korea, then Japan, then Indonesia, uh, all the way up to India, and now Australia. The Chinese look at this and they, and, they, and they hear us saying, oh, no, no, we're not trying to contain you. We're just trying to make sure that <laughs> we maintain our position as an offshore balancer and a, a party of interest in the East Asian region. They don't believe it for a minute. So we are headed towards, I think, a much more tense relationship, possibly um, an arms race in Asia. Uh, both countries don't want war. Both countries would like to have a, a productive relationship, but it's going to be difficult to keep them going as well as we have so far. Now, what about Japan? They had a new prime minister last December. Noda went to Beijing to pursue uh, talks with the Chinese about uh, Europe, uh, Pacific currency yeah. and uh, other issues. I mean, is this a, a sign of two porcupines mating? Or? <laughs> <laughs> they don't get along very well, <laughs> and uh, for a very good reason. Uh, one of the big mistakes, I think, uh, the Japanese have made is they have never done what the German Republic did, which is to reconcile and fess up, so to speak, to the atrocities of World War II for which it was responsible. The Japanese have never done that, and the Chinese will not let them forget until they do. But. Ch uh, Japan today is also strengthening its relationships with South Korea, um, with Indonesia, with the Philippines, and for the very same reason that we are, which is they don't distrust China in a paranoid sense at this stage, but they distrust it in the sense of don't bet your whole farm on them being your ally straight through the, the next several decades. So. Yes, they've gone to China, but it's not that they are leaving us. In fact, they're strengthening their relationship with us. They are trying to do everything possible to see that uh, they play a role in keeping uh, East Asia Pacific and productive. Okay, well now the real news out of China is this scandal, which yes. uh, seems to be uh, uh, at the foreground of attention all over the world. The, the, uh, they have this, uh, politician Bo Zhilai, who uh, uh, was uh, the head of uh, the megalopolis uh, uh, Chongqing, and uh, he was grooming himself to be uh, one of the nine rulers in the Politburo. Right. He's a really big guy there, and uh, suddenly he's ousted and he finds himself incarcerated. His wife is charged with uh, poisoning a British businessman. Uh, what's going on there? Is this really a, a, a chink in the armor of China? Is this a, a, a break in the whole power structure? Well, if the past is prologue, uh, they will come down uh, with all force on Beaujolais now. He'll be lucky if he just goes to jail rather than uh, execution. And his wife is in deep trouble, too. But behind that is a much bigger story, which this is... This is over the... Uh, poisoning of uh, Neil a, Haywood, that's the right. uh, British businessman who yeah. was well, then cremated without an autopsy. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, one of the spear points. Another one, of course, is um, the police chief Wang who... Uh, um, Wang Lijun. Wang Lijun, who went to the American consulate and tried to uh, get himself uh, sent over to the United States, and uh, we, we were having none of it. And he yeah, told you're an old journalist. Wouldn't you have liked to have been a fly on the wall in the consulate when he's there spilling everything? Absolutely. Yeah. And he did spill apparently a great deal, but they're being He's being, being charged with treason it. now. He's being charged with treason. <laughs> and um, the thing that's different today than I think uh, an earlier period is that in this, age, this di di digital age of tremendous capabilities to get p information out and around, even though China tries to control it all, they can't. And so they're having to deal with the Bojolai issue and with the, <clears throat> the police chief issue in a more open way than they, I think they would have in an earlier generation. I'm not sure we would have known that Bojolai was in trouble. I'm not sure we would have known about the police chief going to the American consulate 15 years ago. Well, uh, they must uh, have been sensitive to this because uh, there was uh, an article in uh, uh, the China Daily that called for harsh criminal sanctions against 
those who spread rumors on the internet. Right. And uh, they've been shutting down uh, uh, tweets, they don't call them tweets, they call them, I think, Weibo's in China. Weibo's, yeah. Uh, that uh, deal with the whole incident. So there's been a complete uh, cover of silence and yet an awful lot has escaped. The, well, the, they, I think they know that there is no way anymore to have a complete cover uh, of silence. They just, but still limiting it so it, it doesn't become topic A for the entire population is still in their interest. But more and more, China is learning that if you can't beat them by controlling them, then you've got to join them. For one of the things I find fascinating is that the, the propaganda arm of the Politburo in China has now an array of uh, people who go on the internet to do nothing but praise China and to answer anybody who's making a case against it. In other words, if you can't shut it all down, then go in there and shadow box with them. And what they've been preaching is that this isn't part of a political power struggle. Uh, they protesting that this is simply uh, the invocation of the rule of law and of uh, yeah. transparency and honesty in the part of public officials. Uh, because Boji Lai was supposedly uh, exporting large sums of money uh, out of the country, which is illegal, and using Neil Haywood to do it. Right. Well, with uh, um, I, it'll be interesting to see how they explain all of this to the Chinese people, which they have not done. You think they're protesting too much? Uh, no, I think they're trying to make it just a case about corruption and uh, scandal and to keep it away from the deeper story, which is the divisions that seem to be growing within the Chinese leadership elite. Bo Zhilai represented a school of thought and one that uh, uh, Hu Jintao and uh, when the current president and prime minister and their, back, their factions find very threatening. He wants to go back to a Maoist era of far more state intervention into society, into the economy, and uh, massive anti-corruption campaigns. Now, Bo himself was corrupt, <laughs> but he was going after too many other people who were corrupt, and uh, there's probably not very much of the Chinese elite that isn't afraid of corruption investigations. So uh, it, this is a great blow to uh, the neo-Maoist side of the debate within China. I mean, we're really seeing uh, a, a crack in the, in, or a hole in the dike that never was visible before. Jim, I think that's probably the case, but the thing that we all have to be aware of all the time is we probably only know a sliver of what's mm -hmm. going on behind the scenes in China because it still is a very, very close society. All behind and the Great Wall. All behind the Great Wall. <laughs> And I've talked to some of our Chinese scholars here since the Beaujolais incident blew up who say, look, he may not be finished. It's not just a case of Bo, it's a case of a whole faction within the Chinese leadership group. And uh, we have to wait to see whether that is really crushed or if it just had a bad turn, is it going to come back? Because the issues at, at between the two groups uh, are, are fundamental, they're not just about day-to-day -day corruption. They're about how you're going to run the state, how you're going to confront the United States. Uh, a far more nationalistic, uh, sort of militaristic group is what's behind Bo. And uh, a lot of Chinese leadership groups now think that that is dangerous and not also good for China. Let's turn to the Middle East. You can't talk about the world's right. hot spots and fault lines without talking about the Middle East. Uh, there have been talks with Iran over its uh, nuclear program. Uh, they've now been put over until May. Uh, where do you think, how do you see that as playing out? Well, once again, I would just note in caution, there's only so much we know about what's going on in Iran. It's a very close society itself. There does seem to be some evidence building, and it's led to some commentary back here we were talking about earlier, that the, re the Ayatollah regime may be prepared to make some concessions, if you will. They won't call them concessions to get themselves off the hook. Of they call the them expressions of confidence. Expressions of confidence for which we would uh, have reciprocity ish, um, measures. Um, and wh what, I th what I think is bringing all this around about is to a certain extent, the impact of the sanctions regimes is really very tough. And there is now a very large part of the Iranian public, it would appear from looking at some of the surveys and so on, that really would like to see a settlement rather than a war. 
yes, they want nuclear capabilities, pride, and all that sort of stuff, but w at what price? The second reason, I think, why they may be ready for some significant talks about concessions is that they take the Israeli threat and the possibility of uh, support from the United States for that at some point. They take that very seriously now. Now, in, they should. in the mix is a digital component. There's a website called <laughs> Israel Loves Iran. Yeah. Uh, what do you make of that development? Well, um, everybody, I, I just mentioned the Chinese doing something that uh, almost of the same, which is talking to their own public uh, about the positive things of their society and their governance and so on. Everybody is understanding that in the digital age with uh, uh, cell phones, camcords, and all the rest of it, there is a huge explosion in the information environment, and you cannot control it just by trying to camp clamp down on it. So that is an example, I think, of Israel trying to create some support within the Iranian pop population, general public, for a negotiated settlement versus a war. Israel loves Iran is a people-to-people -people phenomena. We really have nothing against you, and we'd love to give you our recipes and you can give us yours and so forth and so on. It is, um, and you have to take this with a grain of salt, I have only s one source for this and it's on the Israeli side. There is a lot of traffic on this, uh, the, the, they say tens of thousands. And the responses are very mixed from why don't they go treat the Palestinians right first and then come talk to us to yes, there's no reason why we should hate Israel and uh, we'd be perfectly happy to have a settlement. Remember history, it was uh, the Persian King Cyrus who uh, led uh, the Jews out of the Babylonian captivity and back to Israel. I'm afraid they've all forgotten <laughs> that. They've all forgotten that. <laughs> In any event, it's, uh, it's an indicator, it's not a significant. The more significant things I think to keep an eye on are how much damage is being done by the economic sanctions and how credible is the threat of a military response if they can't come up with a negotiated solution to the problem of nuclear capable, capable we weapons. Will war be avoided? I think there's a chance of it, but I think, again, th there's just so much we don't know. For example, we're talking about uh, splits within the Chinese uh, elite. There are now splits that are even more apparent within the Iranian elite. And so we have this phenomenon that um, one week, uh, the President Ahmadinejad will announce something, and three days later, <laughs> Rasanjani, head of uh, uh, another governance operation, will deny it. And then Ahmadinejad doesn't show up for work. Yes, right? he doesn't show up for work. And all the time, the Ayatollah, who doesn't speak much at all, uh, is sitting in the background manipulating the real scene. Saying that a nuclear war is against our religion. And um, we all hope he means that. Yeah. But there is a tradition, apparently, in uh, Persian culture called religious dissembling, where it is okay uh, when your religion is under threat to dissemble, which is to lie. <laughs> so whether he's telling us the truth or not, and whether, even if he is, would that be the determining factor? We don't really know. Well, moving on, along to uh, another uh, fissure, uh, Egypt. Yes. There was a Twitter revolution in Egypt. It was supposed <clears> to bring democracy to Egypt. Uh, there's a run-up to the election, and uh, the three top candidates are disqualified. Uh, what's going on there? It seems public confidence in uh, the uh, election process is at the yeah. lowest ebb. Well, at the time of the Arab Spring, you remember a lot of commentators saying, now look, be careful. Very often a revolution is by one group and it's overtaken by another. It happened in the Russian Revolution and so forth. Uh, I think that's one of the things that's happening here. Egypt as a society uh, does not have all the building blocks in place to move directly into democracy. They have a very strong extra constitutional army. They have uh, a judiciary that's anything but independent. They have a parliament which is uh, not uh, a particularly strong force. And so what you see happening now, I think, is that the ingrained interest groups that were there before the Arab Spring are in a position to manipulate and influence things more than this generalized youth group, which to date uh, can only express itself through massive demonstrations, and you can only get so far with that. You can't govern that way. 
Well, uh, the Army is where the power resides at the moment. Apparently. And uh, the Army says uh, no elections until we have a constitution. Mm. And the constitution is supposed to enshrine the Army in, in power. Uh, so, I mean, where are we headed? More democracy or a milita military dictatorship? I think, uh, I think it's a matter for real concern that we, that we don't really know what's going to happen at this point. They could go back into a, <clears throat> a kind of a mass demonstration, civil confrontation between these forces in Egypt. And if that happens, I think this time around, the army would be much more forceful, a lot more deaths, a lot more destruction. Uh, I'm not at all uh, optimistic in the short run about developments in Egypt. Long run, uh, I think there's a chance that they can, after a lot of trial and error, two steps forward, one step backwards, continue down a progress of, uh, that is more um, pluralistic than in the past. Egypt is a big country. It is a great culture. There are all sorts of things there to build on at some point. But the Arab Spring came out of nowhere before some of these institutions that are so important to being able to run a civilized society had not been perfected yet. So will the Twitter revolution succeed or fail? I think in the short term it is not succeeding. And in the longer term, I would hope it would prevail. Well, uh, let's move on to Syria. You talked yes. of death and destruction. Uh, it's really appalling what's gone on there. 9,000 dead in the course of a year. And uh, uh, there's supposed to be a ceasefire, but it hasn't held completely. Uh, what do you see is, uh, is happening in Syria? Will Assad hold on, or will uh, he be deposed? Well, first of all, let's take a look at what's been happening, which is uh, there is opposition and, and widespread, but completely disorganized, and answering to no single body of uh, influence or potential power. That kind of an opposition cannot win a confrontation like this. The only way Assad, I see it, is going to be removed uh, is if an agreement is made with the Syrian army at some point, just like with Egypt and Mubarak, which is the, the man has to go if we are to preserve our position in, in society. The only other way it's going to happen is with a very large external input, like in Libya, where NATO came in and bombed the hell out of the place. I don't see us putting up with that. I don't see any of NATO's partners saying they want to do that this time around. Because among other things, you have two very big, potentially influential countries that would go crazy if we did that, and that's China and Russia. So I think there's a much better chance that uh, there's going to be a civil war on a long-lasting one uh, than almost any other. So almost full circle, the Syrian foreign minister is traveling to China to meet with uh, top officials there. I mean, uh, China is going to tell them to uh, cut out the violence. Yeah, China and Russia have both uh, uh, changed their signal a bit. They do not want regime, regime change, an obvious one, in Syria because they don't want regime change anywhere. That leads people to say, well, why not have a regime change in China and Russia? They gives regimes that. a bad name. Right, gives <laughs> a very bad name. <laughs> what they do want is change within the regime that is more, leads to more progressive and more economically successful approaches. And so China and Russia both are telling Assad, you've got to compromise, you've got to reform, um, you can't keep going this way. They're not saying they won't support him, but they're just saying they're not supporting what's going on right now. Uh, let's uh, move on to uh, Afghanistan. Hmm. We had violence in Kabul uh, recently. Uh, the uh, uh, United States is committed to uh, a drawdown and eventually a pullout. Uh, and we have a presidential election coming on. And certainly Mitt Romney wants to carve out a special place for himself on on this issue, uh, uh, do you think he can? Yeah, let's start with that last part because you know, it's about to come down on us. The newspapers, that just as we're talking, have been having stories about the fact that Mitt Romney's campaign is developing a major report on Afghanistan and all the mistakes that the Obama administration has made. Hmm. Now, where they seem to be headed is to say we should never have announced a deadline for withdrawal. We shouldn't be uh, withdrawing that soon. We need to back uh, the Karzai government and uh, the Afghan nation for a much longer period of time than 2014. 
That's not a very saleable message in the <laughs> United States, I don't believe. Most of the American people want us to pull out yesterday. They do indeed. Now, what I hear is, as you know, there are major discussions going on now between the Karzai government and the coalition forces, which is essentially the U.S. And the purpose of those discussions are to get a long-term strategic relationship going between the U.S. and Afghan. And parts of the components, it would appear, would be some American troops will be there for quite some time, but they won't be combat forces. They'll be training forces. They'll be support forces and so on. And secondly, there will be a long-term program of financial aid and military aid to Afghanistan in the, in the million, billions. That, I think, is likely to happen. And does that solve the problem in Afghanistan? No. But what it may do is to calm it down to the point where we really can um, co consider it a minor problem rather than a major one. Jim Hogg has been just marvelous. I have a question for you. Yes. Can the net cool down the world's hotspots? <laughs> uh, yes or no? No, it no, cannot. It, it, it's more likely to contribute to it. Thank you so much nice for coming right by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. For The Digital Age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.